Hey, morning, everybody. It's good to be here. It's good to be back. It's good to be back at C3. Yeah, it's been a few weeks since I've been here. Not that I've been um, just wasting time at the bar. Um, it's been a wild summer for me anyway. My, If you weren't here a few weeks ago, my oldest daughter got married um, on the northern coast of Ireland where my family's from. And uh, a couple weeks ago, I took my middle son off to college. So I always heard like, you know, oh, parents cry. And I thought, Pfft. <laughs> so that was a thing. Um, yeah, it was. Uh, and, you know, as, as probably most of you know, I'm in the middle of transitioning and moving away from this part of the world and from all of you and um, down to Georgia where my wife's family is from and we'll all be living in the same small town. And so, um, yeah, it's just one of those seasons where I kind of know what's happening, and mostly I don't. <laughs> um, lots of unknowns, and and I just got back from the Tetons. I was um, I had another Animus Valley Institute program. This is where I've done my guide training for the last seven years, and I um, it kind of felt like a sort of full circle for me because I was in the Tetons about seven years ago, really at the beginning of my my training in this kind of uh, wilderness-oriented, uh, psychological, spiritual stuff, whatever you want to call it. And I was back in the same place again, in the same camp- campground called Grovant Campground, and right along the Grovant River. And um, yeah, and, and I think coming up out of uh, six days sleeping outside is partly what inspired the question for today. The question for today is, does beauty matter? And it's not a, I'm not offering a simple solution like, well, just go to the Tetons, they look nice, you know, um, or go stand by the lake. I'm, I would like to at least have a larger conversation about beauty and about our relationship with beauty. And, and it's a complex conversation. I mean, in, the, in our pre-talk, right away, we were just down in, in the weeds of all kinds of possibilities and noticing that all of our, most of what we would consider the great human tradition has been in conversation with beauty from philosophers to artists. Um, and it's a deep part of, of how we come to know the world and how we come to define the world and part of, I think, our own longing. So anyway, that's the kind of territory I want to I wanna roam around in. I'll start with a Rumi quote here. Let the beauty we love be what we do. Which is an interesting way of putting it. Let the Beauty we love, be what we do. There are hundreds of ways to kiss the ground, he says. <laughs> um, okay, so my first sort of question behind the question is, whatever happened to beauty? Um, and here's a, here's a line from Hans Jors van Balschel, sir. <laughs> I'm sure you were just reading him this morning, you know. He's a theologian, but just listen to his little, little uh, weaving here. Our situation today shows that beauty demands for itself at least as much courage as do truth and goodness. Okay? He says beauty demands for itself as least as much courage as do truth and goodness. And in, if you know anything about the Greek world, beauty, truth, and goodness were kind of like the Holy Trinity. <laughs> and so he's like sort of turning these things around. And then he says, and she will not allow herself to be separated and banned from her two sisters. Meaning truth and goodness. She will not let herself, she will not allow herself to be separated and banned from her two sisters without herself in an act of mysterious Vengeance. Wait a minute. She will not allow herself to be separated and banned from her two sisters without herself pulling away in an act of mysterious vengeance. He's trying to describe the kind of modern predicament we find ourselves in where beauty seems to not be so much of a value. And if beauty goes, he's saying simply, there goes truth and followed by goodness. So, okay, we could wonder, hmm, 
Is modern life in a wrestling match with truth right now? Does truth seem to be few and far between as, a, as an experience and even as a value? And you might wonder, well, what does that have to do with our relationship with beauty? Or something like goodness. Just think about that word. Even if we spend the rest of our lives debating what we think goodness is, there's also kind of an intuitive sense for it. Certain acts strike us as good or as, as infused with goodness. And we, start, we might start to wonder, where are those? And all he's saying is, we might want to pay attention to our relationship with beauty because she's likely to take these two things, truth and goodness, with her on the way out. <laughs> oh, man. So what is it about our age? And I'm going to pick on some things. David gave me a little warning. He didn't know he did, but he's like, don't be too quick to pick on um, all things contemporary and modern. That's not exactly what you said. But you were, and I thought, yeah, good point, but I'm going to do that right now. <laughs> because in some ways, our age is quite vulgar. The age we live in is quite vulgar. And it's quite artificial. It's an artificial dimension. And even, you know, the, one of the most important conversations that's happening right now is something called artificial intelligence. It's the word that I find interesting right now. And we definitely live in an age that's very fickle. It's this, no, just kidding, it's that. And that applies to just about everything and every position and every ideology. It's certainly an age where we value glamour and glitz. I mean, whatever is glamorous, whatever is glitzy, at least attracts our attention, like the little shiny objects. And we live in a culture that has associated, to some extent, beauty, or I might say glamour and glitz with whatever is expensive. Whatever is of higher economic value must be equated to what's beautiful, and therefore, if we follow the Greeks, what's true and what's good. Yeah, and what else? We live in an age, on the other hand, that's obsessed with the expensive and, and our economy is driven by whatever is cheap. It's kind of this strange paradox. And I might also add that much of what we would call the art world is a world of ideology. That's almost the first question people ask now with art, is what are you trying to say? I'll give you an example. This is, I'm going to take you inside my very creepy mind for a moment. Um, how many of you have been to Art Prize? All right, so a friend of mine helped, was uh, part of the creator of, of Art Prize, and so I knew about it before it became a, a thing. And, and as he was telling me about it, I started thinking, oh, what would make a good Art Prize installation? And this is what I thought of, okay? <laughs> this is very dark. This was in the middle of the Iraq War. Remember that? And at the time, the United States government issued a, a kind of decree to the media that they weren't allowed to film the coffins that were coming back home. Did you know that our government did that? You know what that's called? A totalitarian state. Like, hey, we can send our kids off to war, but let's not photograph their coffins on the way back home. So I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to take the exact number of young people who have died um, in the war, something like 3,112 or whatever it happened to be at the time, and fill the Grand River with the same number of body bags. And then I looked it up, and body bags are kind of hard to get a hold of. <laughs> okay, now, it, that's an interesting cultural statement, wouldn't you agree? People would have been talking about it, but that's art as ideology. What's my primary motivation to make a statement? Okay, and that's, what, that's what's driving a lot of the art world right now, for better or worse. It's like our media. Do, I find it fascinating. Let's just roll back the clock to the 90s, the best era. And I think most people would assume, if in a conversation around journalism, most people would say journalists are supposed to be objective. Okay? And that's the goal. That's what most people would say. And, of course, this is, you know, I don't want to go deep into the academic world here, but, you know, post, po the postmodern critique was also 
infiltrating all elements of academia and media at the time. And so what the postmodern critique came along and said was this. Um, there's no such thing <laughs> as objectivity. That everything, everything is infused with some kind of bias. Now, on the one hand, we would say, that's true. Wouldn't you agree with that? Maybe we'd say, okay, ultimately, there's no such thing as pure objectivity. Okay, I get it. You'd think the next move would be, because we know this, let's try to be objective anyway. But actually, it's gone in quite a different direction. Just take our media outlets. What do we expect them to do? To be mouthpieces for an ideology. That's what Fox News is, whether you like it or not. Guess what? That's what CNN is, whether you like it or not. There's not even an attempt anymore. It's like, this is where we stand, and we'll get the experts, the statistics, the studies, the books, the authors that support, generally speaking, our point of view, and we're going to call that news. All right? So even our media is, be is moving toward a kind of um, ideology. And almost the most... Um, common relationship the average person has with art is with advertising. <laughs> I mean, what are we all talking about on Monday morning after the Super Bowl? The ads, you know, because I don't even know. I actually like football. I'll just be honest with you. I'm not like some kind of saint, you know. Um, oh, I'm above sports. No, I'm not. I'm, um, but I don't know who won the last Super Bowl. I can remember certain commercials. <laughs> that's, that's dark, you know. But that's almost our most, that, you know, that's our conversation with beauty is through advertising. A lot of the time right now. Okay, I'm going to pick on some other things. I was seeing how much time do I want to go into this. Um, okay, <laughs> some of you are afterwards who are going to fight me on this. Just wait till afterwards. I was um, I like these uh, um, uh, renovation shows on TV, okay? Back when I used to have a TV in the '90s, um, and like you know whatever Chip and Joanna, whatever their name is, you know any of these renovation shows, I like them because I've I've renovated two houses myself, and I I just like the process and I like the conversation, and I've just noticed something over time that. They all have the exact same formula, and they all actually have the exact same aesthetic. It's like each time they act like it's a surprise. They walk into the house and say, you know what we should do? We should knock down this kitchen wall, and then we should open up the space here, and we'll have an open floor plan, and the kitchen will spill into the living room, and the living room will spill into the dining room, and then we'll go out to the, and it'll all be, you know what? We'll all be into simple, clean lines. That's the line always, simple, clean lines. And I have a great idea. Let's paint everything white, okay? And then we'll paint the outside black, like, oh. And people are always amazed. It's, oh, it's so beautiful. And let's take whatever the most popular, simple, clean piece of artwork that no one has any relationship with, and we'll put that on the wall, okay? This is sort of the, the aesthetic and the dynamic, this kind of like, it reminds me of a hospital, Simple, clean lines, white walls, everything stripped down, everything utilitarian. So I just think, oh, this is an interesting phenomenon. And I, I start to ask the question, what is our relationship with beauty? I mean, maybe it's that the phone is so floods us with an unlimited fire hose of information and noise. When we sit down, we don't want anything in the house. You know, we just want, I don't want any input. Maybe... Maybe that's part of it. I remember the first time I walked into my analyst house, and uh, she was born in Israel, and she was 85 years old, and it was an explosion of all kinds of strange things, like African masks and hand-hammered tin trays and a menorah that had spilled and burned part of the cabinet and little knickknacks from here or there, and uh, libraries full of books by Jung, and then libraries full of, of uh, books on art, and then magazines strewn about, and a, a f an actual fire. I don't know if you've ever seen these before, but there, there used to be these things called fireplaces, and inside wood went, and they lit on fire, and then like the, the smoke went up, and it kind of kept the room warm. 
this kind of thing. And I don't know, there was something about it that it felt like in this space there was a living conversation. Nothing was sterile. And in part, it was her living conversation with beauty. There was a painting on the wall that her, her grandfather made. You know, It didn't come from Target. No influencer was posting about it. I just thought, this is a, this is a different way of, I don't know, relating to the conversation around what is beautiful. And then I was thinking about American Idol. <laughs> or any one of those shows, those sing-off shows. And they're quite popular. They even have one. I don't know if you've seen this or not. The Masked Singer. It is the dumbest show on television. It really is. It's like it's completely idiotic. They sing for a while in this mask, and then they take it off. The first time I saw it, they took it off. And they're like, it's so and so. I'm like, who's that? <laughs> anyway, here's... Another, here's what I call these shows, um, a giant expensive karaoke contest. <laughs> and I think, what is the relationship between beauty, art, song, music, and these shows, which is essentially karaoke? And the number one question that's driving these shows, at least in my opinion, is who's the next famous person? And how will we know if they're famous? We'll know if they wow us with some little dramatic skill inside a song we already know. Like, it's kind of like the national anthem. I'll pick on the national anthem. First of all, the melody's not that good, just in my opinion. But watch the World Cup sometime, okay? Even if you don't care about soccer at all, just watch the national anthems of the country and countries. Here's what every single one of them has in common. They stand there, arm in arm, with brothers and sisters from their country, and they all sing at the top of their lungs, no matter what. What do we do? Karaoke. Who has the fanciest little frilly voice that can wow us, and we put the individual there, and like, oh, they went up an octave during the word free. They went up two octaves. Like, what? That's our experience of the national anthem. It's very privatized and... And you wonder about our relationship with beauty and you wonder about our relationship with other words like truth and goodness. So yeah, I'm picking on things here. My kids um, were in choir or you know, band when, when they were in school and, um, and I started to notice a phenomenon. First of all, I like choirs. Choir is, like, choir is a lost art form really at this point. It's sad that they've gone away you know, because the beauty of a choir is like you all can be in it. Almost anybody can be in it. And it's, this, it's, like, a, it's like a living um, relational uh, expression that, that has its own kind of beauty to it. But anyway, here's how the choir concerts would go in high school. You've got the choir, they're singing the song, and then we're all waiting for this part where one kid is chosen, he or she comes out, sings five words, and you know what every single time people do right after they're done? They clear, and they, they, you know, they clap and cheer. They did it. They did the solo. And then they recede back, and I think, we've got a problem. <laughs> That's my general feeling. I, I, I was like, no one wants to talk to me after the choir concert. But <laughs> I just think, yeah, um, it's vulgar. It's cheap. It's karaoke. We're losing our relationship with beauty. We don't even know how to ask questions about beauty. We're more interested in who's famous, whatever the show is, Whatever is fickle, whatever is there one moment and tomorrow is thrown into the fire. That's a line from Jesus, actually. So we're confusing fame, I think, with beauty, in a way. If it's famous, it's beautiful. And think about the phenomenon of uh, influencers. You know what an influencer is, you know? Now, if I was an influencer, I wouldn't be picking on them. I'd be like, hey, you know. But the influencer goes around pretending this is my ordinary life, and then sells us things <laughs> like, hey, here I am just cleaning the, my sink just like every other day with Windex, you know. It's like, uh, what was that show um, with Jim Carrey, that, that, uh, the Truman Show? Yeah, it's the same thing. It's like we're just living in the Truman Show and whatever. I mean, people find unusual make ways to make a living. I'm not trying to come down too hard. But you wonder where the honesty is. You wonder where the aesthetic is and you wonder where the beauty is. Do they really love these things? 
Are they really drawn to this particular kind of couch? Or did that company give them $20,000? And this is a, almost our, our whole conversation with beauty, really, from a cultural point of view. And so here's a wondering I have. What if we turn toward the beautiful? I wonder if we would also, in a strange way, be turning toward some of the greatest challenges that we face as human beings on this planet. I just wonder, what is the, how, how would that dynamic go if we valued beauty? What if we valued beauty in conversations around housing or developments or the way streets are arranged or the way stores are arranged or how we shop or how we interact or how we walk down the street? One of the most amazing things about living in Ada is that the taxes pay for a walking path. Why? Why? What kind of conversation is needed that, you know, um, what, is, what is our conversation with beauty and how might that affect just the daily way we relate to life itself? Okay, let me read you some things. So I brought a book with me. This is a John O'Donohue book called The Invisible Embrace of Beauty. All right, so here's a little from the beginning, just from the intro. Our times are driven by the inestimable energies of the mechanical mind, he says. Its achievements derive from its singular focus, linear direction and force. When it dominates, the habit of gentleness dies out. We become blind. Nature is rifled. Politics eschews vision and becomes the obsessive servant of economics. And religion opts for the mathematics of system and forgets the myth- mythical flame. Whew. Instead of true leadership, which would be the servant of vision and imagination, we have systems of puppetry which are carefully constructed and manipulated from elsewhere. We never know who we are dealing with. Hidden agendas operate to deepen our insecurity and persuade us to be hopeless. When was this written? I'm like genuinely, it's not one of those fake things. I'm going to pretend to see when this is written. 2003. 2003. This problem has gotten worse. Let me read it again. We never know who we are dealing with. Hidden agendas operate to deepen our insecurity and persuade us to be hopeless. Our present dilemma is telescoped in this wonderful phrase from the Irish writer and visionary politician Michael D. Higgins. The acceptance of inevitability in our lives is consistent, of course, with the suggestion that there is but one vision of the economy and end of history, the death of ethics, and an appropriate individualism that eschews solidarity and any transcendent public values. That was a mouthful. But we forget about things like the greater good, is what he's saying. Yet consistent struggle leaves us tired and empty. Our struggle for reform needs to be tempered and balanced with a capacity for celebration. When we lose sight of beauty, our struggle becomes tired and functional. When we expect and engage the beautiful, a new fluency is set free within us and between us. The heart becomes rekindled and our lives brighten with unexpected courage. It is courage that restores hope to the heart. In our day, to our, in our, in our day-to-day lives, we often show courage without realizing it. However, it is only when we are afraid that courage becomes a question. Courage is amazing because it can tap into the heart of fear, taking that frightened energy and turning it towards initiative, creativity, action, and hope. When courage comes alive, imprisoned walls become frontiers of new possibility. Difficulty becomes invitation, and the heart comes into a new rhythm of trust and sureness. There are secret sources of courage inside every human heart. 
yet courage needs to be awakened in us. The encounter with the beautiful can bring such awakening. Courage is a spark that become the flame of hope, lighting a new lighting new and exciting pathways in what seem to be dead and dark landscapes. He's saying we need a more courageous way to live and beauty is the ingredient. That's a surprising suggestion. You'd think it would be more power or uh, more, more willpower even or clearer thought or not, a, not that any of those things are without value, but he's saying there's something about beauty that lights a flame that spills over not only to make our life better, but the greater good better. Okay, the Greek word for beautiful is related to the word calling. Did you know that? The word, word calling. Now think about the last experience you had with beauty. And think about a word like calling. Like there's something about it that both calls to us, awakens us, and sometimes gives us a sense of our own calling. I watched um, uh, a film by, by the band Sigaros. They're an Icelandic band. They made a film a few years ago in a, in a small theater in, in Grand Rapids. And, and I kind of, I mean, I kind of knew the band, but I really didn't. So it was really my, my first exposure to, to this band. And, and all it was was just different... Um, scenes of their concerts around Iceland mixed with the landscape of Iceland. That's all. Very simple film, really. Just a river <laughs> and the music and a field, things like this. And uh, partly I'm going to make a suggestion about beauty w- real quickly, which is oftentimes beauty is an experience. That's what I'd like to suggest. And what happened to me was a kind of experience. And when I walked out of that theater... Here was my overwhelming feeling. What the hell are you doing with your life? (laughs) That was my conclusion. Not like, that was amazing, that was beautiful, now I'm going to follow Sigaros around Iceland or whatever. It was, what the hell am I doing with my life? See, beauty awakens that conversation of calling. What am I called to? How am I, what is my relationship with what's beautiful? You can make any room in your house more beautiful. Did you know that? (laughs) Easy. Follow an influencer, simple, clean lines, knock down the walls, paint everything white, okay? It's not a formula. It's a conversation. And I think an experience of beauty awakens our own capacities for that conversation. So I was thinking about some of my own experiences. And first of all, an experience with art. So when I was 20 years old, I was in London with my family. And um, my dad and mom, my my siblings, we were on the way to Ireland, but uh, we had a stopover in London, and and I wanted to go to a museum. And so I don't remember which museum I went to, um, but I wanted to see, like, one of the big paintings. I didn't grow up, you know, knowing much about artwork, really. I'd heard of, like, the big ones, like Monet and Van Gogh and things like that. And I was like, oh, I want to see a Van Gogh, you know, the dude that cut his ear off. Like, he's just another crazy Dutch person. So that's about all I knew. And I thought, all right, I'm going to go. I'm going to make a pilgrimage, you know. Um, no one else wanted Maybe my sister went. I can't remember um, exactly, but I want, maybe it was just the two of us and went to the museum. And, and I knew Van Gogh was there because they had little signs up uh, about it. And he has, now I know he has multiple um, sunflower paintings, but the most famous one is what I was looking for. And, and I came around the corner, and it was, in, it was kind of in an apse. Like, uh, well, you know what an apse is. I'm, like, trying to describe it. <laughs> it was kind of in an apse. And, and right by a staircase, it was kind of an unusual place. Like, you could stand on the ground and see it, and you could also walk up the stairs to the next exhibit and sort of also get a view of it. And probably... Um, at no point in my life and probably no point since have I had quite the same experience with a piece of artwork. It's like, it like pinned me to the earth. That's how it felt. I was so surprised. And I was so surprised by the depth of the painting. Like, I was, I don't know what, I mean, I used to go to the woods and draw when I was a kid, and it's, you draw on this flat piece of paper, you know? I mean, it was like, it was like crawling out of the, out of the canvas is how it felt. Just the thickness of the paint itself. And, and do you know how long that experience lasted? 
I don't know, five years or five seconds. That's how it felt. Like, and, and I couldn't recreate it. It's not like I could go around the corner again and have the exact same experience. It just pinned me to the earth for a second. And that's an experience of beauty. And it awakened also very much the same feeling. What the hell are you doing with your life? Beauty and calling and truth and goodness, they all start, start to awake, uh, awaken. And I thought about another kind of funny image. I just, I just had an image of when my daughter was two years old. And we went to the beach and covered her in sunscreen, and you're supposed to do it as a parent, and she just immediately rolled in the sand like, you know, like a battered fish, you know. But it, it, and it was... And the amazing thing is, like, to her, there was not a problem, you know? This is as if that's what you do. First you get all this stuff on, and then you roll around on the sand. And there was just something about that image of her with her, like, you know, sandy skin and the ocean, you know? And it's like, it takes you. Like, you're taken by this, and it's a gift, and you can't plan it. It's not like that's what people do to experience beauty, like afterwards, we're all going to go down to the beach, we're going to cover each other in sunscreen, we're going to roll in the sand, and, and everyone in Grand Haven would say, how beautiful, you know? You just don't know, because it's like a living conversation with the world, and sometimes it just knocks you over. And, and I thought about another time when I was 19, I, I went to Yellowstone and with, my, with my buddy, and we got a, a backcountry uh, permit, so we were way deep in a place called the Lamar Valley. And um, I thought there was an earthquake, and I was so excited because I'd never been in an earthquake. You know, I was born in Virginia, lived in Michigan. I was like, yeah, I was like yelling. I was like, an earthquake. And, and I was awesome because we I was in a massive field. It was like, what a great place to be, you know, experience an earthquake. I was imagining, you know, like surfing on the ground. And, and all of a sudden from over top of the hill came a, a, a herd of buffalo running full speed. Yeah. And it was both a brush with death and also with beauty at the same time. It's like, and it's fleeting. It's like, I couldn't have planned that if I tried. And really, the feeling wasn't so much, what the hell are you doing with your life? It was more like, this would be a great way to die. (laughs) I'm serious. Again, my mind, I'm sorry. (laughs) But there's something about the fleeting nature of beauty. It's in conversation with death itself with what is here today and tomorrow's gone. And, that, and it's infused with meaning because of that. Listen to this beautiful passage, speaking of, um, of beauty and death. This is from John O'Donohue. Again, he says, One year in university, at the end of the semester, I returned home for the summer holidays. When I walked into the kitchen... My father looked up at me, and I saw something in his gaze that I had never seen before. Some finality had entered his looking. Whether whether it was out in the mountains or among the fields around the house, his eyes had glimpsed a door opening towards him. His countenance had become more luminous, and his natural gentleness was being claimed by a new silence. As we held each other for a moment in that gaze, I knew death had picked out his name. Days later, illness arrived, and in three weeks, the door of death had closed behind him. The gaze had revealed everything. Time had stood still. The image of that gaze has always remained with me. For it was a moment of the deepest and most tender knowing, a moment radiant with the strange beauty of sadness. Maybe you know what he's talking about. You know, beauty, sadness, death, finality, limits. I can't go back in time. You know, none of us can go back in time. I can't go back in time and roll my two-year-old in the sand. (laughs) I didn't roll her. She rolled herself. I can't. It's gone. It's It's a vapor. And that living conversation evokes something beautiful about the human condition 
and about human culture. About the whole, about the collective, about our shared relationship with what's beautiful and meaningful and fleeting. Where's that? You know, where's that in your own life? Where's that in our culture? Those are part of the questions that I'm asking. Can you name something beautiful from this week? There's a challenge. Name something beautiful from this week. Just name it. Say that happened. <laughs> and guess what? It won't happen again, not in quite the same way. When, when was the last time you were surprised? You know, like just surprised. What are your most beautiful memories of your own life? Honoring them is a sacred thing, really. Speaking about them is a sacred thing. Maybe all that's fleeting, all these fleeting glimpses are what we mean by the sacred. And part of what makes something beautiful is that it reminds us of death, of, of the temporal, of love and awe, and, you know, which is all taken by wind and time and the soil. Exactly. <laughs> So is beauty in the eye of the beholder? First of all, I'm not going to argue about this, but I'm going to say no. (laughs) Sort of, and not really. Maybe it's an I don't know. I don't think so. I actually think about, this is the way I put it, I tend to think about beauty as being in a web. It's in a web of time, really. It's in a web of time and inside a web of relationships. That's, I mean, even symmetry itself, which would be a whole other door we could open when it comes to beauty, is a web of relationships. It's a dynamic way things are related. And the experience of beauty is caught up in something. Inside a dynamic is what I might say. It's like an emerging presence in conversation with the universal and with the ancient languages of human beauty and of what's sacred and and of awe itself. Okay, I just got back from the Tetons and I'm I'm gonna end with a with a poem here. And um, the Tetons are quite a magical place. They rise up from the valley floor. The valley floor is already at 6,000 feet, and they rise up another 6,000 feet. And they're some of the oldest rocks in North America, like something like 2.7 billion years old. And um, they jut up out of the um, out of the valley floor with a kind of like majesty, and and it's a it has the feeling of being a a very old place, and because it is. <laughs> Even only 200,000 years ago, there was, it was under a mile of ice. Think about that, a mile of ice. What a wild place. And you've heard of Jackson Hole? That's a reference to the geology of the place because the hole goes down 7,000 feet into the earth. It's like, what a strange, majestic uh, landscape that has very little do, to do with human presence and existed before anyone, including the, uh, the indigenous tribes of North America, ever set foot on this continent. You know, so it's that, it's that kind of place. And um, I, was, I was at a campground along the Grovant River, and uh, it looks out on this kind of sage flat where the moose like to come out in the morning, and then there's like this, this uh, rise that's left over from the, from the ways the ways that the glaciers receded and then, and then the, the mountains um, rise up from there. And, um, and every day, I, was, I mean, I was part of a program, I was a participant of a program, every day we were just out and about, not very far, but just kind of we would go on little wanders, giving little practices or ceremonies, but mostly just being in relationship with the place itself and let it, letting it affect us. Like being in being in conversation is the is the way I would put it, and there's something quite amazing about staying put for six days and sleeping on the ground. It's like there's, it's like it change. It's the landscape itself changes you, it changes the way in which you relate to the world, and so every day I would uh, go for a swim in the in the Grovant River, and um, one day I I had an experience, and that's what I'm. I'll read a little poem based on the experience. This isn't like a well-crafted poem. This is what I call a spontaneous poem. I had an experience, and then sometime later I had one line from that experience, and then I just wrote for like three minutes until I didn't feel like writing anymore, and that was the poem. 
I just I'm trying to I wouldn't say capture. Maybe there's something I want to say even about poetry. This poem is about an experience I had in the river, which I would say was an experience of beauty. And the poem is itself something else. It's not the experience. It's like Ansel Adams has a famous painting of the Snake River with the Tetons in the background. It's not the Tetons. <laughs> it's a co- in conversation with whatever was going on for him. And same with this. All right, so I'll end with this poem. I tied my first fly at 15. Bird flight into bird flight. Repurposing wings as wings. And just today, that boy went swimming again. I level with the water, moving as the water, already washing bits of me to the blessed ocean of death. I saw a mayfly land on the water. I could have tied such a fly if I was God or something. And I said out loud, this is what the trout eat. And I smiled, teeth full of glaciers and snow melt. Then from the depths, turning her head as if she was turning ever more fully into the world, came a cutthroat right in front of my astonished eyes. And from I I know not where came a grief cry, echoing to the bottom of a 7,000-foot hole spilling over granite, finding forgotten fissures in the stone. The tears were made of death and by death, and I cried and wailed for only one reason, beauty. Thanks for listening.